I will um, pick a few thoughts from, from the governors in the room, the deputy governors, just to get a sense of their experience on the ground so we have a more uh, a broader conversation, so to speak, with as many uh, variations of experiences as we can get in the room. So I don't know if someone can help here. Is there anyone who wants to, to, to take this uh, first? Dr. Yulta, you're nodding, so you could start. And for those who are not uh, familiar with, because uh, you know some of us uh, may not know, especially the newer governors, so please just take uh, a time to just introduce yourself a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Joa Ageo. My name is Dr. Yulita Chariot. I come from Nandi County. I'm the Deputy Governor. Um, thank you for the presentations that have been made. One of the, uh, the issues that I have as coming from Nandi County well, is that uh, I think as, as a country we really have to have a serious conversation around this sub whole subject of uh, public participation. I think uh, with all with the two levels of government and other sectors uh, being involved, somehow if we could handle it in a structured manner, we might be able to achieve some results. But as we speak, I'm hearing PS devolution speaking of uh, the national government doing civic education. I'm wondering where that happens because the people are in the counties. There is no involvement between the national and the county governments on the whole area of, of public participation. Uh, just the other day, we had our members of parliament conducting public participations at the, at the sub-county levels. By the time we went round ourselves to, uh, to do public participation on our, on our all subject of CIDP, the public do not want to come because they know that there's no money being given out. So at the end of the day, really, we, we, I don't know whether we are approaching it the right way or do we really need to reorganize ourselves and you know, probably do it differently. Secondly, as much as we are, we are asking ourselves why is it that the chiefs and the sub-chief barasas people attend and they don't uh, get paid? One of the other things which we need to also be consciously aware is that uh, time is money. People give their time to come. They've left uh, what they wanted to do to come and make contribution or to listen to you, make your presentations. What does that translate to? How do we view that? In the long run, how do, uh, are we justified to dismiss people for expecting money? Or are we also being unfair to them, asking them to come make their contributions? Or should we just continue with the previous uh, way of deciding for the people? Thank you. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Hamilton Orata, Deputy Governor, Homer Bay. There are two things that probably come out here. Participation, public participation is a right. Every citizen is supposed to chart their course, to determine what they want as their development. Therefore, that responsibility lies with the national government to help create the civic education that this is a right, such that the county government picks it from there. I'm saying so because this concept of public participation started with the advent of devolution. And devolution is hardly five years. Our people were not used to it. They were used to going to the chief's barasa where, whereby it was one-way traffic. The chief would tell you the government issues. But I think it has come such that the development of the country, by extension development of the counties, depends on the public particip participation. They are the people who determine what they want. Right now, we are busy with CIDPs. There's public participation element of it. But people, the opportunity cost for people coming to give their views also must be taken into account. And finally, what is the threshold? What qualifies to, be, to say that we have now achieved the public participation? And I think that goes back to what King said. There, there needs to be issues to be addressed there. Because it's not the number that comes in. You can have a number who have no say. And then there's also the professionals probably who can also 
have an input. So really the issue here is what is the threshold of uh, public participation so that if somebody goes to court, you can say we met the threshold. Thank you. All right, thank you. And please let's keep them brief so that we, ha we can have many views. Governor Kingi. Thank you, Joe. Uh, my name is Amazon Jeff Kingi, Governor Kilifi. Uh, I, I think the lack of regulations to anchor the right to public participation um, has actually contributed to the fact that quite a number of counties have come up with different ways on how to midwife this uh, particular right. I'll give you an example in Kilifi. When we came into being, uh, we thought then that uh, public participation meant that all citizens must have uh, a say in whatever we, we did. And therefore, we used to cast our net generally. And uh, we would announce, hoping that we'll get as many people uh, to come out to uh, make their voice heard. But we realized that even the, the, um, the participation you know, wasn't that great. And therefore, we decided to make sure that we have meaningful public participation. We would identify stakeholders. For example, if we are supposed to reduce uh, levies in the markets, I wouldn't want or I wouldn't wish to bother uh, a young man who is working by the beach uh, selling couriers to come and in a meeting where I'm doing public participation to reduce levies in the market. So I would identify the participants, the people who will directly uh, who will actually be affected by that particular decision to come and sit uh, in that particular meeting. In that, then, I use my thinking then was to discourage the lack of participation or the lack of attending this meeting on the reason that uh, if I go for this meeting, I expect some cash. If, for example, I want to remove some illegal structures along uh, a road, uh, and I invite these uh, people to come. If I invite someone who is not directly affected, those are the kind of people who will demand money to come for this meeting. But the people who are going to be affected directly by that decision to remove these illegal structures, those are the people who will come whether they're going to be given money or not because it affects them directly. And therefore, we structured our public participation on stakeholder and, and, and subject-based uh, uh, discussions. To the extent that today, if I'm calling for uh, public participation, the first thing is I identify what is the subject. Who are these people who are going to be directly affected uh, by the decision that will be made pursuant to this meeting? And uh, in that engagement, we found that we're getting a lot of participation and uh, without necessarily people saying, unless you give me lunch, uh, I may not be able to come there. So because of the lack of regulations, every count has been left to really structure their way on how they're going to do public participation. On the issue of uh, civic education, public participation was supposed to come after the citizens had been, um, have been uh, sensitized on their rights and all that. Now, I remember in the uh, first years of devolution, uh, quite a number of counties had actually budgeted for civic uh, education, but we were told that a uh, curricula was supposed to be developed, uh, to be rolled out uh, throughout the country. Uh, I don't know through the ministry whether this curricula is ready, but I, I doubt because that has not been uh, made av available to us. We need to prepare these people. We need to tell them the importance of, uh, of public participation, unless they appreciate uh, the importance of public participation. There is no way someone who is le uh, looking for a shilling uh, to put food on his table will abandon his day's uh, work to come and see to do public participation unless they've been told that public participation is so key that you need to drop whatever you're doing to come and let your voice be heard. So I think there's a lot of work that should, uh, ought to be done between us uh, and, and, and the national government to make sure that uh, proper meaning is given to the right to public participation. Again, public participation should not be seen as a, as a preserve of the county governments. Uh, I can assure you that I think all, if not most, of the county governments are taking the right to public participation seriously. My biggest drawback or my biggest disappointment is, 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 is to see how casually the national government takes this particular right. I don't remember any legislation 
that has been passed at the national level that got some public participation input in it, leave alone engaging the county governments. There are some issues that uh, we are fighting with the national government in courts, things that we could have actually ironed out on a table through public participation. So I think we need to get serious on this issue. It's a, it's, it's, it's a public value. It's a right guaranteed under the Constitution, but we need to give it uh, true meaning. But we need to sit down at both levels of government to make sure we structure on how we do public participation. Again, my colleague has just said here, many citizens now are running to court, challenging pieces of legislation, challenging policies, challenging decisions that have been made by governments. The question is, at what level do you satisfy public participation? At what level can you comfortably say, yes, I've done public participation? And, and, and I think through the regulations, that question could that, that's, get That's answer. a good question, which I'll put to, 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 the, to the panel shortly. Yeah. Um, I please, want to please make it brief. Yeah, I yeah. Your, I boss, want your boss is up here. So yeah, I, I want... <laughs> <laughs> but I have a voice. I want to make... Uh, I, I want, first of all, to thank the panelists, even in the first, in the first session. And uh, I, as uh, Professor Kanyingi was... Uh, giving us um, his input, I'm worried that uh, very low percentage of public participation. So actually, we are in a crisis. But then one of the things that I have not heard uh, people uh, talk about is uh, for any meaningful participation, we ought actually to incorporate diversities. We need to incorporate women, youth, children. Of course, in Makweni, we, 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 we are trying. But uh, these sometimes are voiceless. So what time are we going out there for public participation? Because of what women and men do. So also, we also need to create processes and also empower our ward administrators, our village administrators to actually do truly, truly public participation. You can't go to a hall and start uh, asking questions and you, you are only targeting one person or two people. Who are you asking those questions? If it's budgeting, who is responding to the questions? So I think processes of animation, people really need to, to know how to animate groups to actually be able to do truly, truly a public participation so that what they say they own, what they say they, 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 can, they can stand for it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Jacob Chipkwen, Deputy Governor of Baringo County. Um, my contribution to this is that uh, we need a, a change in our mindset. Uh, when you look at Evolution. The understanding in the village like there is that money has come from the national government to the governors. The governors have a lot of money. So the understanding is when there is public participation, it's money being brought by the governor to the people. So we need a change. We need a lot of civic education for them to understand and have a change in the mindset. Secondly, uh, when you look at public participation, we, it is left to the old in the village. The semi-illiterate people in the village who doesn't know what should be done. Uh, I tend to think that we should have a forum so that the educated from these particular communities can also contribute from the diaspora and uh, contribute to the development to the village. Because when you go around there, you find those who don't have employment, those people who are desperate, who are thinking about that development in the village. So I tend to think that uh, we need a total change. We need the change in the mindset. We need the national government to do a lot of civic education so that they understand what devolution is all about. Because uh, even uh, the other stakeholders, like the private sector, they need to come down to the grassroots. KEPSA should come to the village. Where are industries in the village? The roads are being created. For what? So the, we need really to, it should be a concerted effort so that all of us uh, can, can
can really change that mindset. Uh, another thing I want to say is that um, uh, these are people living below a dollar. Their main uh, issue is the stomach. And you are telling them come for public participation. What really can they contribute? Because their basic need has not been made. Those people who are living above the dollar are in the towns. They are working somewhere. So you are left with the villagers there who should make decisions for themselves, which I don't think can really um, enhance their development. So I think we need a change in the mindset and have people from the diaspora, have the elites from these particular villages having time to come down and contribute to this development process. Thank you. Th thank you. Let's, let's go on this other side before we can come back here. Then we'll open it up um, in the next round. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. May I wish to just mention a few points. Number one, uh, for public participation to be very successful currently, we must make it structured. As I sit here, I was wondering, the people behind me all come from counties. When were they ever last involved in pub public participation for their counties? And so I think, as I congratulate my brother and my senior, uh, Mwalimu Kibuda, for the, such a wonderful job. It, does he involve the professionals from Akueni? I think we need to go down that line, look at them, and also involve them. Then, do we also believe in public participation? Are we doing it because it's a law? It's being forced down our throats. Do we really want to connect with the people? Do we want to hear from them? Or have we gone there with our own preconceived and made up minds? This is a question that we must ask ourselves. It would be wrong for us to go to them and really try to push down their thoughts, our thoughts. Let's hear from them. Let's accept them. Let's take their thoughts. Now, there is also another problem we have in this country. Politics never ends, and we must always ask ourselves, at what point do we stop politicking and start working? Because try having public participation where you come from, and the opponents go to the other side, and anything you say is not good enough, even if you said what they had said. This is a challenge we need to ask ourselves, because this is messing up the kind of public participation we want. We want to have it as an open, you know, really pour out our hearts, but we are there asking ourselves whether I belong to the right or to the left. We also need to end by saying this. If I contribute today, does somebody take my contribution seriously? Am I able to follow it up and know that it was implemented? And then we ask PS, why haven't you had a public participation with governors? All right, that's a direct question. I'm sure you'll be answering it. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Dr. Zhao, the Deputy Governor Kitui. Uh, I appreciate the panelists for the good presentation. Uh, I just want to bring the concern of public participation as pertains the county level and the national level. Uh, as it has been said, the national government, public participation is well attended. What I should state is, one, uh, the existence of the county governments is just now one regime of exactly four to five years gone now but the national government has been in existence. So there is that tendency that the assistant chief, the chief, have been there. And number two, the national government, most of the incentives to the community comes through the assistant chiefs and chief. For example, if there is relief food, it comes through the same office. If there is any takeoff of animals, in case of drought in any county, the national government uses the 
same offices. Also, the elected leaders, whether an MP, MCA, or governor, you may find if he wanted to bring development to his people, our people, he goes to the national government. I think they, we have had such cases like MCA, governor, just going to the national government to say, I am just working the national government to make sure my people, my constituents, or my electorates benefit. This shows a lot of resources are held at the national level. And due to that perception, when there is any activity called by the national government, you find a lot of involvement, unlike in the county government. Also, there are, there are some, uh, like, uh, youth fund, women fund, either disability funds, all those things are held by the national government. And that is one of the reasons when the, when the provi provincial administration, the former provincial administration, goes for public embarrassers, you find a lot of uh, partic participation. Because these people in the later cause, they understand to be paid back through those incentives. When it comes to the national county government, uh, we have the MCS and the governor at that level. You find these people are almost at the ground with the electorates. And that perception, this is a politician. Any meeting called by a politician, they expect to have politics, and where there is politics, they expect to be given something. So that notion is there. Thank you. Governor Tichilo. Thank you. For me, I believe we need a total paradigm shift in this question of public participation. As I said earlier, the culture is already in us that public participation is about reward. It's about being given money to participate. So to me, we must have a paradigm shift. And there are many ways we have experimented myself and I think it's working. First is the civic education. We must have a targeted civic education that completely is um, different from the way it has been done before. And I think, to me, we should leverage on technology. Because this country now, everybody has a mobile telephone. People can use phones. So on public uh, participation, I believe you can use telephone to get information on what people want, we expect to do in terms of development. The elite, as it has clearly been said here, they rarely participate in, 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 in the public uh, participation at the rural level. So we must know how are we going to capture them. In this case, in my case, when I was doing my CIDP, I put a web portal and put all the questions on every sector and asked them to respond. And from there, I was able to analyze the data right, right online, and I got the information. The communities, we must use other forms of, um, of engagement. Like for my case, I have created a community radio where now people can now call in the community radio in their own language and they are able to say what they want. So we have their analyzing all the what they call in the radio every, every minute and we are able to analyze. Finally, we have to also be very careful about public participation because my experience tells me that if we are not careful, public participation can fragment our communities because every community wants their own development. You can find schools littered everywhere. There is a school in village A, but in the next one they also want a school. There is a health center there. There's another one just wants health center. So again, you bring in from tribalism to clanism. So we must also think about the disadvantages of public participation. All, all right. Uh I was, I was going to suggest that we can uh, 
take time and respond to a few of those thoughts, then we can do the next uh, row and, and then now open it up if, 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 if you don't mind. So that some of the thoughts are not. I think we can. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. The thank you, panelists. I think uh, it is great that the, our constitution came up with the issue of devolution. Indeed, it has enabled us to address our issues at ground level. Uh, the issue of public participation in relation to devolved government, I think, is very, very crucial because it enables uh, the local community to decide their destiny and to come up with their priorities. As a result, what comes up is issue of enhanced ownership of the project, uh, issue of uh, accountability and transparency, issue of identity. But the challenge is, many times the county governments may be coming with a very beautiful document that shows that there has been public participation, draw up a plan, but at the end of the day, to actualize that plan is a different issue. You'll find that the document is there, but in terms of implementation, actualization, it is not so. I think there are also other developmental actors at ground level, that is the national government, we have also the civil society and NGOs, and also the counties. How do you harmonize these actors at ground level so that they can be able to, to address the issues critically in terms of priorities? Because you find sometimes somebody from national government comes up with a project, a plan, possibly, or a dam, which may not be a priority of that people, or which may have been reflected in the, in the CIDP. So I think there's need to harmonize these actors in terms of, of participation. Finally, who are we targeting in terms of participation at ground level? Many times you find that uh, an MCA or a local leader at ground level may be hijacking the processes just because he is driven by his own interests to get a particular project at that place, possibly, which may not be a priority. And I think it is good to involve that very, very vulnerable person at ground level to address or come up with issues or priorities. Of course, there are middlemen here who will want to uh, shift paradigm from the priorities of the community to their own priorities, actually. I think that is an issue that we need to, to look into. And finally, I will say that uh, uh, we need to engage ourselves at all levels to address these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very Maybe much. The distinguished gentleman from Marsabit, right? Yes. yes. Um, Solomon Gubo, Salomon the Deputy Gubo. Governor Marsabit. Uh, first thing is to appreciate the fact that uh, devolution is there. And for us from marginalized uh, counties, we really appreciate devolution because the national cake at least now is reaching some parts of the forgotten area in Kenya. So, uh, one thing that I want to say about uh, public participation is uh, where we place the citizens as leaders. Are they the first priority or the leader is the priority? What I've discovered in Kenya is that uh, the leader he has his own dreams, his own visions, his own ambitions to achieve for the, for the years that will be in leadership. So, this, the interest of the citizens is, is never applicable, it's never anywhere in his program. So what he wants to achieve for the next five years, for example, as governors, is our dream. Say so that when we come back after five years, we want to use this as our campaign tool, that I have achieved this for my people. What we need to change is let the, the, the population, the citizens, be the priority number one. In so doing, their interests will be taken care of. Uh, the idea that... Uh, uh, now ideas should come from bottom to top. I think it's, it's, it's not still practicable in Kenya. The hangover that everything comes from the top is still in us, in all of, our, of all of us, the leaders. We, we, should not, we should not hide or not try to escape from this. The fact is, we still want to drive our ambitions. As the leaders, we want to drive our ambitions. So the ambitions of our people is, is never important to us. Uh, I come from Marsabit, 
and uh, we, it is the vast county in Kenya. And the challenges are so big. One corner of Marsabit County is more than 500 kilometers. So when we, we say we want to reach every part of Kenya, you cannot even reach every part of your own county. It becomes a challenge. So driving these ideas or collecting ideas from all corners of Marsabit County is so expensive. Now where we go and discuss about the resources for, for devolution. But apart from that, there is no way you cannot give money because you want to pick people from one corner. One ward is so wide, people are living far apart. So you must carry all of them to one position and sit with them. In so doing, you can get their ideas. Otherwise, it becomes a big, big challenge. And the communities living in, for example, in my county are more than 14 different counties with different needs with different desires and different plans that they want to achieve for their people. So harmonizing their ideas becomes also a challenge for us leaders. And uh, finally, the part of politics that have been mentioned by the governors. If a governor attends a forum, let me, let me say it sincerely. Governors, when they, we go around, people, will not, people know very well that we are carrying bags of money. It becomes a challenge. This has become a problem for even serving our people, even in our offices as governors. Let's come out very clear and say this. Because people come to see you for, for small, small problems, and they forget that you're supposed to address big issues for our people. It becomes a challenge for us. So when you address a problem of 5,000 shillings, and you forget the big problem, then after five years, you don't have answers. Because the, the same people will come back and ask you, what have you done for us? You know? And then, the final thing that I want to say is, for us, the leaders, who, who takes us to, who, 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 who helps, holds us responsible? Who holds us accountable? Because after five years, nobody comes to ask you, what have you done for us? If you know how to play your cards properly, you will still come back. So you must have, you might have not even changed the lives of your people, but you can still come back if you know how to play your cards. So I think, Differentiating politics from development is one big thing that is a problem in Kenya. Thank you so much. Oh, th thank, thank, thank you very much. Then, uh, to allow well, me please to add a little voice to what has been said. Uh, <laughs> it's public participation, yes. Uh, I think um, we have to look at these things from two levels a way to involve everybody and does everybody understand what is supposed to be done or we are doing this as a PR exercise. What uh, Governor McQueen has done is impressive but it might not work in many places. The diversity of people, the political background, whether they like you or not, because if they do not like you, you go to public participation and they finish you there. So how do you reconcile this? I was uh, of the view that uh, as much as we go to every level, we should make it possible that we have a selected few, not necessarily those ones who, who think uh, the way we think, but those people with the understanding who can come to a forum and discuss issues and see the way forward. Otherwise, it will be a jumble and the people will be fighting. We have had a public participation. Sometimes people get humiliated under the, because they are not liked. You may go to a place where you are not liked. Of course, everybody knows that... Uh, you are not liked everywhere equally. But it's, it's not that we fear and fear away from, uh, from, from uh, those areas. But it's important that we have a structured way of having filtered people, people of understanding. When we have done the public exercise, the public PR exercise, you know, when everybody has talked, we have people who can come sit together 
and then come up with the resolutions which might help us to move forward. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Governor Nyagarama, uh, ending that session momentarily. But we're going to come back here and just get a few of the responses because I think uh, the things that come out, jump out of the conversation for me is the whole question of civic education and the peers, you have something to say about that. But there's a point I think that has been made repeatedly here, and I think uh, uh, the Deputy Governor from Masabit, uh, Buanagobo, uh, summarized it well, where he was saying, where is the priority? Uh, if you are campaigning out there, you promise certain things that I'm going to do A, B, C, D, and then you have to go back to the people and say, okay, what do we do, how do we do this? How do you reconcile those? Because at the end of the day, uh, Professor Kibwana, the people will say, you promised to do A, B, C, D, what happened? 